Hello, my name is Linda Shore, and I'm the director of the Teacher Institute at the Exploratorium. I'm Mike Petrich from the Exploratorium. I'm the director of the Learning Studio. I'm Karen Wilkinson, and I am a project director out of the Learning Studio. I'm David Barker. I'm a senior graphic designer at the Exploratorium. I'm Lori Lambertson, and I'm one of the teachers in the Exploratorium Teacher Institute. And I'm Luigi Anzivino, and I'm scientific content developer at the Exploratorium. The Exploratorium's role in this project was basically to bring the Exploratorium's philosophy of hands-on learning, scientific investigation, to the monasteries of India. The Exploratorium's culture and history is all about questioning authority, questioning things that you take for granted, discovering things that surprise you, then doing investigations on those surprising things and trying to figure them out for yourself. And that's exactly the way these monks sort of approach life. You know, let's find things that surprise us. Let's find things that we want to do inquiry on. Let's try to figure this out. Let's question everything around us. So a first impression of Sarnov is complete and utter chaos with animals and sounds and smells and people and interactions happening all around you, everywhere you look. And all it takes is a few minutes to slow down and just pay attention to one street corner or one small shop and you realize that it's just a couple of people having an interaction and then they move on. What's even more impressive is as we started walking into the countryside and spending more time with the villagers, all it would take is one deep look into somebody else's eyes and realize that they're a friend with you, they wanted to have conversations with you, and that's how we spent most of our evenings. One of the first things we tried to have the monks do was figure out what mechanisms might be involved in making these contraptions move in various ways. We had them draw and then discuss what they'd drawn, and one of the things that struck me was, again, how physical they were in their expression of their ideas, and how little, I want to say, respect they had for boundaries that maybe we assume would be there. It would be very easy for them to just pick up whatever object was around and use it and try to make their point, and how lively that process was. Arriving in India not knowing much about Buddhism at all and spending time with the monks was an eye-opener in many ways, but I think probably the most intense part for me was just how absolutely focused and imaginative they were and being able to, to shift from looking at things in the physical world and thinking about them very deeply, but also arguing different perspectives. I mean, I, 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 I had no idea they would be so gifted in that way. They were thrilled to do this and overly eager to explain to each other, to make drawings to one another, and actually came up with some pretty interesting ideas. Not all of them were the quote-unquote right answer, but at least all of their ideas were their own ideas. It was a good starting point for the activity. In the culminating activity with the, with the monks, we decided to do a large collaborative piece, a chain reaction. And in this one, it was sort of calling upon all the things we had done together so far, but kind of investigating phenomena directly. Then there were all these other little add-ons with switches, and some used computation. So the, the level of thinking ratcheted up quite a bit by the end of the week. Monks worked in teams, and they were responsible for their own project, but they were also responsible for setting off the next contraption in the chain. When things wouldn't work, it seemed like they had even more of an ability to go deeper and really point out in each other's ideas kind of where problems were, how, how you might solve them, and had multiple ways of solving things. We did learn a lot about their tradition of debate and sort of looking for different perspectives or different solutions. I think it's, it's something that led them really to be natural builders, even though the first day when we talked about we were going to be kind of a community of makers together, constructing things and ideas throughout our time together. They actually laughed out loud, thinking, um, I think they thought it was funny. They didn't really think of them as makers, and in fact, were absolutely incredibly gifted makers. <laughs> Although each of these projects, each of these elements in the chain reaction are really unique. They're using a variety of unique materials, they're constructed in different ways. Everybody here is exploring some simple ideas. They're all using a motor. They're all completing a circuit between a battery and lights. They're drawing on some of the previous experience that they've had 
with using cams and levers and gears. Some of the some of the early activities that we did with the monks became apparent as they would start to build contraptions into their reaction. And the funny thing is that not everything worked. In fact, most things didn't work. But that was okay because the hours that were spent in setting up each of these contraptions, that's what the activity was about. Oh God! <laughs> Well, this was quite an experience for us. We landed in India. India, of course, is a very interesting country in and of itself. We landed in Mumbai, and there was the hecticness and the craziness of the traffic. Then we passed through the rural countryside, which is very agrarian and so on, and seemed to have a lot of poverty associated with it. And we had the great opportunity that there was a, uh, a special ceremony to um, honor one of the former Rupaches of, of the monastery. So they had this fabulous celebration with Tibetan horns and drums and the, the fancy headgear and so on. And it, was, it was quite a tremendous you know, outpouring of town affection for this person who had been the head of their monastery previously. We had a number of activities that were dealing with the idea of visual perception. So we used some illusions as a way of sort of tricking the eye-mind system in order to show how the system worked. We had spinning discs, which we made out of, with CDs, with marbles hot glued into the middle, and then we put a piece of paper on it that had a pattern on it. One of them is the famous Benham's disc, which is a black and white pattern of, of circular lines and then a, a black semicircle. And when you spin it, you see a variety of colors from deep reds to deep browns and greens and blues. And this is very unexpected because you're getting colors out of a spinning black and white object. This has a lot to do with how the eye brain system works and sort of the differing receptive, receptive times of the, of the cones in the, in the eye. Did you see it? See the colors? I see the colors. Where, what colors did you see? Brown? The, at the middle, downward, I see a blue color. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit upward, there are kind of yellow. Mm -hmm. And the one is a little dark yellow or brown, something. Not it's almost like a burgundy brown. kind of color I see sometimes, too. Sometimes, like, a little bit darker. Yeah. Yellow. But it's a black and white, it's all black and white. And how's it creating color? Yeah, that's, good. that's a good answer. We also uh, dealt with the idea of how you perceive three-dimensional objects in space. I handed out some cards to the monks and asked them to draw a simple cube that I was holding up in the air. And they showed it in a variety of different ways, m many quite different than the others, but they were trying to take this image or this in their mind's eye of a cube, present it in a, in a graphical format. So then we um, took this cube and basically made the edges of the cube out of soda straws that were held together with little bits of pipe cleaner. By doing this, we could take a cube and look at it and see it in two different ways. Uh, we had a sense of, you could make the cube actually sort of flip in your mind's eye, um, having one corner appear to be the corner that was closest to you, and then by force of thought, you could make that the furthest corner away from you, because this, this cube had a certain ambiguity to it, and certain of the monks could actually walk all the way around the cube and sort of make the cube spin in space in their mind's eye. Another thing that we spent a lot of time with was um, various effects with mirrors. The idea that your reflection in your mind, if it's presented in a certain way, appears just as real as a real object and the various ways that mirrors could distort the way that we see the world around us. We dealt with spherical mirrors and cylindrical mirrors and so on. We also dealt with how one coordinates with the way that one sees things around. Don't look down. No looking down. <laughs> it was so difficult because the fact that what they were seeing was, was flipped and placed in a, a different space by the mirror than they would expect in their normal life. So we, we see that there are certain assumptions that we make in terms of what's real, what's up, what's down, what's right, what's left. Utilizing a simple material like a mirror allows us to really investigate pretty deeply these concepts.